the formidable robot. It was the fall of 2009. I was 23 years old, I was getting ready to propose to my girlfriend at the time, and had been in town all day searching for the most beautiful ring I could get her. After I had found her something nice, I headed back home and I had found a package on the doorstep to my house which I had just bought for 70 grand. I brought the package in and opened it up, and sure enough, it was that VHS of The Incredibles that I had ordered online. I saw the movie in theaters with my younger brother in 2004, and we loved it. I had been trying to obtain a copy of it for myself, but until this point, I only ever saw it when we rented it from Blockbuster or Family Video on DVD. I ordered the movie on VHS, as I still had my old VCR I got in Christmas of 2000 and plenty of movies. I figured, why not? I already had the other Pixar movies like Toy Story 1 and 2, Monsters Inc., and Cars which is an extremely valuable tape in current years. The tape I ordered was a clamshell copy and had different artwork from what was seen on the officially released VHS. It had Mr. Incredible on the front cover on a red 2D background and the tape had your typical late 2000s ink label. Having a long day of searching for engagement rings, I put the tape into the VCR which was hooked up to the TV in the living room, then I grabbed a Monster Energy drink and some tortilla chips and cheese as I eagerly awaited for the movie to begin. There were some trailers, but nothing I couldn't fast forward past. The first act of the movie played out just as we all know and love. Mr. Incredible's car converting into its second stage and him pulling over in the street to get the cat out of the tree, all while catching the bad guys in the process. Then of course, Buddy getting ejected out of the car and the interaction between Incredible and Elastigirl. All was well up until Bob turned around and saw that guy who was about to jump off the building. For those who haven't seen the movie, Mr. Incredible jumps forwards and catches the jumper. But in the version I watched, he was a second too late. Mr. Incredible would crash through the window by himself and the jumper successfully committed suicide. Our hero looks over the edge and sees the man on the street, in a pool of his own blood with people quickly surrounding him. As he looks at the chaos below, a bomb suddenly goes off and blows a hole in the wall, and the French supervillain Bon Voyage comes out. From there, everything plays out pretty similarly to how it should. Buddy rockets in there and talks their ears off, and then Bon Voyage tosses the explosive onto his cape. Mr. Incredible manages to get the bomb off of him, quickly snatching it off. For a moment it beeps in his hand, and then at full force he proceeds to chuck it at Bon Voyage, to which it explodes in his face and brutally kills him. As the bomb blows up, Buddy quickly flies off into the city. Dust and debris is everywhere, and Mr. Incredible simply stands there, brushing it off of his suit. Taking one last look at the dead villain, who has a very horrific wound on his head, he walks off and heads to the church for the wedding. I was extremely surprised to see this kind of violence in a Pixar film. It reminded me of something from a Resident Evil game, or old war footage. At this point, I had put together that this was not the movie I watched plenty of times before, as it was 5 to 6 years old at that point in time, and I had watched the movie enough times to know none of this happened in the film. But anyway, the scene of Bob and Helen's wedding passed, the bit about the supers being sued only there was no mention of the train crash. Instead, Mr. Incredible is painted as the bad guy for not successfully saving that guy's life, and blamed for the wreckage of the bank. After this, the movie plays out as normal up until the dinner scene, in which we see an alternate scene. The point where Helen tells Dash to tell Bob about how he got in trouble at school, and then Bob starts to congratulate him by saying, You must have been booking, how fast do you think you were going? He gets distracted by Helen as he's cutting Dash's steak. Suddenly, we hear the plates break and then the camera pans down. Bob had accidentally pressed the knife down on his fingers. However, none of them were separated from his hand. There was a dent in the blade from his super sturdy knuckles, which were a tad bloody since it was a sharp steak knife, but Bob only saw that as a minor inconvenience. Right, first a car, now I gotta pay to fix a tape. Car! He gets up, and goes in the other room. Then, the movie proceeds as normal, with Frozone coming over and the burning building. 
Once again, everything seemed okay, that is, until we reached the scene where Bob and Mr. Huff are having the argument in his office, in which Bob spots a person being mugged outside. He heads for the door to go help the victim, and stops in his tracks when Huff yells, Stop right now, or you're fired! Of course, the bad guy gets away, and Bob is absolutely pissed. Instead of throwing him through the walls and into the filing cabinets, Bob grabs Mr. Huff by the neck and launches his through the window into the alley, killing him on impact. As Mr. Huff hits the pavement, we hear a loud crunching sound and then the camera switches to Bob's point of view. He looks down, through the window at Mr. Huff's dead body, and says, Uh-oh. Then, we see him being carried off on a stretcher, into an ambulance. Following is pretty much the same scene with Bob and Dicker, except on the street, and then he goes home in his little car with a broken window. If you're a Resident Evil fan like I am, do you know that feeling when you're in the save rooms and on the other side of that door, evil is awaiting? Like the Hunters, the Lickers or Cerberus? A feeling of uncertainty and anxiousness. Those were the feelings I had as I continued into the film, as the scene where Bob finds the tablet with the classified message from Mirage. If you've seen the movie, you know. He is assigned to fight the Omnidroid on the Man is an Island. Next was the scene where he's talking to Mirage on the jet, and discussing the mission of shutting down the Omnidroid 9000 without completely destroying it. Bob is in his blue suit, which fits him even less than it does in the real movie, you can clearly see part of his belly and the suit is also faded, almost grey. Bob is stuffed into the pod, and shot out onto the man is an island. However, he lands in a different part of it, closer to the Omnidroid's whereabouts. Of course, he is stuck in the pod because he's too fat. As he's struggling to get out, the Omnidroid comes out and spots him. It smacks the pod and sends Bob several feet into the air. The pod falls off the trench and into the part where there is boiling lava. Finally, Bob manages to burst out of the pod just as the Omnidroid catches up with him. The robot snatches Bob up with its claws, and what follows made my jaw drop. That thing impaled him through his chest with its claw, and then tossed him into the lava. I could not believe it. I almost shit my pants. Bob screamed his head off as his fat ass sunk into the lava, leaving a mess of blood behind. Eventually, Bob would melt down to a large skeleton and a pool of blood, and the scene intently focused on that for about six seconds. Holy shit, I thought. Mr. Incredible is dead, the Omnidroid killed him. I almost thought I was dreaming after getting hammered. I was beginning to wonder if this was a prank, it was kinda like that video I saw on YouTube where those boys prank their mom with the fake Toy Story 3 ending. Maybe there was a scary face or a rickroll coming next. But then the question arose, who would go through this much trouble for a prank? The animation was on par with the movie and voice acting was pretty close to the likes of Craig T. Nelson and Holly Hunter. There had to be more to this, and my curiosity got me to keep watching. After, well, that. We cut to a scene which is not in the movie whatsoever. It cuts to Helen, sitting in Bob's room full of Mr. Incredible stuff, presumably a few days following when he was supposed to be back. It is the middle of the night. After a minute of her looking all sad and depressed, Helen looks at the display case where Bob's blue suit should be. That's the moment where she figures it all out, at least, the part about him resuming hero work. Helen looks around the room, and then finds the card with Mirage's number on it. She calls the number and Mirage answers. To make a long story short, Helen is quickly discovered to be Elastigirl and Syndrome has Mirage assign a mission to her, to which she accepts in order to go look for Bob. At no point during the phone call did Mirage allude to him being dead, the only mention being that Mr. Incredible was last seen on their island, and that gave Helen all the information she needed. So, the scene that follows showed Helen on the same jet, in her white and red suit from the beginning of the movie. Much like with Bob, the suit was faded and barely fit. Visible rips were in the suit, and it looked very tight on her. For simplicity's sake, just say that you would have been trying to change the channel if Mom walked in. Helen is dropped out of the jet, in a pod into the man -ism. Once she gets out, she immediately starts looking for Bob. After about a minute of searching, Omnidroid V8 pops out and proceeds to chase her around. She swings across trees with her stretchy arms to gain speed, until there are no more trees to swing from. In a sunnier part of the island, 
Helen becomes exhausted and slows down, only for the Omnidroid to snatch her up with its claws, and it tries to pull her apart, much like how it did with Bob. Her body stretches like a slinky and for a moment, it seems that Helen has an advantage, just as the robot uses one of its other claws and puts it into Bob's saw mode. Holding her in its two claws, the robot slices and dices the stretched out Helen, leaving her dead into pieces. Realizing that the target was terminated, Omnidroid converts into its ball form and rolls forward. Then, the camera pans over to that blue bird, which was sitting in the trees a few feet back and it zooms into its eye as the pupil shrinks. We then see the horrible mess that is Helen torn into two pieces, all stretched out like she's been spaghettified, from Syndrome and Mirage's perspective. Mirage looks away from the carnage, covering her eyes, while Syndrome is looking at it in amusement. It killed the supers over the course of one week. Oh man, this is just too good. Syndrome says. Anyway, you've got the whereabouts of another super. Let's go get him. He walks off, leaving Mirage by herself. The screen fades to black, and the movie ends. The second half of the end credits play, except instead of the bombastic end credits theme, the music where Bob was in the computer room discovering all the dead supers, Chronos Unveiled, plays in a slightly lower pitch. The music eventually ends, but the credits just keep going in silence. After that, the closing logos come in. First, the 1995-2007 CGI Disney logo, exclusively seen on Pixar films up until Ratatouille, and then the Pixar logo, which was different. It was a still image, the background was black and the lamp and text was white and shimmering. As it faded to black, my whole body was shaking and I thought I was going to lose it. I sat there, ready to take whatever was next, in the moments of the black screen. Fifteen seconds later, a screen of red color bars would appear. The bar on the left was the brightest shade and the bar on the right was the darkest. A series of beeps and dial sounds accompanied the bars, and a message displayed on the screen. I only saw it for about five seconds before I pressed the stop button and quickly ejected the tape and put it on top of the TV. My god, that scared the shit out of me. I had to go outside and have two cigarettes and then a beer later that night to take my mind off of it. That was seriously fucked up. I guess I'm glad I came across it and not some little kid. My girlfriend would come over later that night to stay, and she noticed that I seemed more anxious than usual. I would eventually explain what I had watched earlier, and that some jackass get me one dollar. She could tell that it messed me up a bit, so we proceeded to get drunk together and, yeah. The next morning, I woke up and she wasn't next to me in the bed. So, I got up and walked into the living room. Well, guess what? She found that VHS tape and watched the movie herself, being somewhat of a Pixar fan herself, although she was more into DreamWorks movies like Shrek. My girlfriend was laughing her ass off the whole way through, purely out of shock, and she cut the movie right as the credits started up. We rewound the tape and put the movie back in its case, and then never put it on again. While I still have the tape, I eventually got the real version of the movie on DVD. Fast forward to 2024, I'm a married man and I have two kids. One son, one daughter. Both are 13. My wife and I were at work one day, and they were at our house with their uncle, my older brother. While we were gone, they got bored and decided to look through a box of VHS tapes I had in the basement, in the hopes of finding a movie to watch. After all, I still have the VCR which surprisingly still works. To make a long story short, I come home and my son asks me if I knew of that alternate cut of The Incredibles they found. Much like myself all those years ago, he too seemed shaken up from what he had seen. My brother had also recorded the entire movie on his phone, as soon as it started getting weird. He just told me today that he was going to upload it to YouTube in pieces, 